Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to INE's webinar for Multicast Basics. Uh, for some of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Rohit Padasani, and I am a full time instructor with INE. And I've been in the industry for about 19 years now. And I have five CCI, CCN route switch, security, voice, collaboration, and service provider. Um, besides training and creating videos, I like to do a lot of outdoor activities. So um, I'm actually trying to learn snowboarding. So should be good. Hopefully I don't break any bones. All right, so without wasting much time, I will get started with the webinar uh, with Multicast Basics. So for Multicast, basically, it's going to be a hands-on uh, discussion also. So I would discuss about IGMP version one, two, three. We would discuss about PIM, how PIM works. We would talk about uh, the different modes of PIM. So we have PIM sparse mode, dense mode, or even the combination, which is the sparse dense mode. So we would talk about that as well. For demonstrating like a lab environment, I would be using this topology where I have about seven routers. Um, all these routers have been pre-configured with IP addresses. They have been pre-configured with IGP, which is OSPF. So I'm running OSPF internally. And uh, multicast has not been configured yet. In, in, in our case, what we would be doing is to simulate multicast and we would use router one as a client and router seven emulating a server. So before we get into the lab, the first thing we need to understand is um, what IGMP is and what PIM is and how multicast actually works. So the first thing that I would like to tell you is that for uh, multicast, you need to know the multicast address space, which is the class D address space. If you look at the multicast address space, it ranges from 224.0.0.0 all the way to 239.255.255.255. That's your multicast address space. Obviously, there are multicast addresses which are basically reserved, like the host multicast address or the multicast address for OSPF or EIGRP or RIP. So there are multicast address spaces within this scope. It is kind of reserved, but um, there's a lot of multicast addresses that you can use for streaming. Now, to understand multicast, there are two terms that you need to understand. The first one is IGMP, what IGMP does, and PIM, what PIM does. So there are two major components for multicast, and they kind of work hand in hand. So IGMP basically maintains your uh, membership in within the broadcast domain, and PIM is responsible for getting that information from the client to server or even from server to client. So basically getting the multicast stream from the server all the way towards the client. Obviously there are different mechanisms for that, but what we will understand is IGMP first. So let me get back to my diagram and we will work on this. So let's say if router one is emulating as a client, obviously in a production environment, you would probably not have a router emulating. It's going to be like a PC, which kind of requires multicast stream. So you may have a multicast client on that. You may have a multicast server application on the server side, but in our case, because we don't have an actual application, we would emulate that by a router being a client. So he is going to send an IGMP join message and another router emulating as a server and he would send the stream. So like I said, the first thing that you need to understand is IGMP and how IGMP actually works. 
So if you look at IGMP, um, there are different versions of IGMP. First of all, there's version one, there's version two, and there's version three. Now, IGMP is basically responsible for uh, maintaining the membership or basically enrolling the client as a member of a multicast group address. IGMP is not sent across multiple routers. It's only within the broadcast domain. So it's kind of like a broadcast that you're sending that saying, hey, I have joined this multicast group address. So everybody in that broadcast domain would hear about the multicast uh, join request from the client. Obviously you have to be IGMP supported and you must have PIM or multicast enabled. So since we are emulating this, what's going to happen is that router one is going to, let's say he joins a multicast group address. So he would send a join message in this broadcast domain, in this network here whichever is the network between router one and router three. He's not really sending it to a specific gateway. He's just sending like a broadcast, like an app request. How do you have an app request for, for uh, ethernet to learn the MAC address? Similarly here, I'm just sending out a join message. Hey, I have joined this multicast group address. And does anybody know who the server is for this multicast group address? Now, obviously the gateway router is a part of the same subnet. So he is going to hear about that message as long as he is PIM enabled or multicast enabled. So R3 who is emulating as a gateway, he's in the same broadcast domain as router one. So since he would be having PIM enabled or multicast enabled, he would hear about the IGMP join message. So it is R3 who is going to be responsible for finding a server for that client. So R3 is going to do, is going to basically enroll or register router one as a client. And once R3 registers router one as a client, then R3 is going to use PIM to find the server, to send a message to the server, wherever the server is on the internet, it could be, I mean, I could use multicast within the premises, within the enterprise network, or I could even uh, use multicast services over L3 VPN. Obviously, since this webinar is uh, multicast basics, we would not be looking at um, the L3 VPN multicast, but if you do want to look at that, then you can look at my, uh, multicast videos for uh, the service provider. I think, I believe it's in the CCNP SP core. There's a multicast video, which is purely focused on multicast over L3 VPN. But in, in this case, we would just be using a pretty basic environment for enterprise network. So router three, when he gets that, he, he registers router one as a client and that's an IGMP message. So IGMP is only within the broadcast domain. It's not that, it's kind of, uh, a misconception, a lot of people think that IGMP goes all the way from R1, all the way to R7, who is the server. That's not true. IGMP is only within the broadcast domain. So it's like me sending a broadcast and it's only contained within the broadcast domain. So R3 gets to know about R1 being a member or R1 joining a multicast group address. And once R1 registers him as a client, R1 will use PIM. So basically here to here and to here, that's basically PIM. PIM is working from R3 all the way towards the server to find the server. Obviously a mechanism could be different. We could use sparse mode, we could use tense mode, we could use sparse tense mode, or we could even use so specific multicast with sparse mode. So like I said, IGMP is for membership within the broadcast domain. Now there are three different versions of IGMP. We have IGMP version one, we have version two, and we have version three. Um, version one and two are pretty similar to each other, but obviously version two is better. So in version one, there were two different uh, membership messages. One was a general query where um, the gateway router periodically is going to ask in that broadcast domain that does anybody need multicast traffic? If you are a member, you would respond back saying, yes, I am still a member of this group. I need multicast. So that's general query. 
And the second message in IGMP version one was the join message. As soon as you join a multicast group address, you send a join in that broadcast domain. And that's the join message. So there were only two messages in IGMP version one, which was a general query and join message. So what was the problem in IGMP version one? There was no leave message. So there was no leave message, which imagine this. Now, you know, multicast takes a lot of bandwidth. So uh, you having unnecessary multicast in your enterprise network, that really can have devastating effect um, on your performance in your enterprise network. Because again, uh, think about it like this. Imagine if you're streaming something and there are multiple streams of multicast going to multiple clients. Imagine the amount of bandwidth that is going to be utilized. So obviously you don't want unnecessary multicast being going across your network when nobody is using it. So the problem with IGMP version one was that there was no leave message, which means that when a client leaves the multicast group address, the server does not really know that the client has left the group. The gateway does not know if the client has left the group. The gateway would only know once he sends a general query periodically and he sends that message asking, does anybody still need this multicast? And now R1 who's left the group, he would not respond back, which basically means that he's left the group, only then the multicast stream stops. So imagine if my periodic message was 180 seconds and R1 joins the multicast group address and at the 10th second, he leaves the multicast group address, which means for 170 seconds, the multicast stream would still continue going towards R1. So, so that's a lot of wastage of bandwidth uh, because of uh, configuring uh, multicast using IGMP version one. So there was no leave message in IGMP version one. IGMP version two came up with leave message. So you still had those two messages, which was the join message, a general query, which was still there, but there was a leave message. So as soon as a client leaves the multicast group address, he sends a leave message in that broadcast domain. So the gateway gets to know that somebody has left the group. And when, some, when he receives a leave message, he triggers an immediate specific query. So now you have three messages, general query, join message, leave message, and there's a specific query also. So we have general query and specific query. Specific query is for that multicast group address. So as soon as R1 leaves the multicast group address, R3 is going to send, a, he hears about the leave message and he sends a specific query back to towards that broadcast domain asking, does anybody else need this multicast group address? If not, he instructs the server to stop the stream, which means your stream stops and you are saving your bandwidth. So IGMP version two was obviously better than IGMP version one. On Cisco routers, the default IGMP version is version two. So you don't really ever use version one. We don't use version one. We either use version two or we use version three. Now, version three, there was a big difference between version two and version three. Version three was used for source specific multicast. Now see in version two, there are two um, messages that you would see in the PIM. So you would have a star comma G and you would have an S comma G. A star comma G usually comes from the client side saying, hey, I have joined this multicast group address. I don't know who the server is, find me a server. That's how the gateway router, when he gets the IGMP star comma G, when he gets that, he uses PIM to find the server on the internet or in your enterprise network. Uh, S comma G usually comes from the server towards the client. So it's the source who's sending the multicast stream towards the group. So, so in IGMP version two, you in your M route, which is the routing table of multicast, you would see two, um, two routes. One is the star comma G, one is the S comma G. 
Now, in IGMP version 3, IGMP version 3 was so specific multicast, so SSM. So IGMP version 3 uses so specific multicast. Now, in that, you would basically not see star comma G. You would only see S comma G. You would not have any star comma Gs. So the advantage of the source specific multicast is that there are two, two advantages that you could, you could think of, or I could think of. One would be that because there's no star comma G, the client itself is telling the gateway, hey, I need multicast from this source. So you already know who the source is. So as a client, I need to know who the source is. So imagine if I had um, multiple uh, servers in different geographical locations and I needed multicast stream. Let's say if I am sitting in uh, maybe India or maybe I'm sitting in the US and I'm streaming, I'm, I want some stream from a multicast server. It would be better if I get, if I'm in the US, I would probably want a server which is close by to the US. It's just faster than to get the multicast stream coming all the way from India. So with so specific multicast, I am actually specifying who my server is and get the multicast stream from there. In IGMP version two, I don't know who the server is. Find me a server. That's why there is a star comma G. So star means any server on the internet or somewhere respond. Now, the second advantage of source specific multicast was that there's no need for uh, rendezvous point. So if I was using sparse mode, I require rendezvous point, which is like a common meeting place for the client and the server. So because the star comma G goes towards the rendezvous point and uh, the S comma G is going towards the rendezvous point. And once the client and the server know about each other, there's a directory between the server and the client. So with so specific multicast, there was no star comma G, which means I don't need a rendezvous point. I just configure sparse mode. I enable so specific multicast and I do an IGMP version three join and that's it. The server will send the multicast stream directly to uh, the client. So that was IGMP version three. So IGMP version three was specifically used uh, for if you know the server. So normally, let's say within the enterprise network, you kind of know, because let's say if I am working for INE and let's say if I am wanting to send a multicast stream to all my employees or my peers, then I could do a so specific multicast within the organization. I don't need to have a star comma G because I know who the server is and I could just get multicast stream from there. So this was IGMP version one, two, and three. So IGMP was only for membership. So just to tell the gateway, I have joined, I have left, when I joined, when I left, which multicast group address I have joined, find me a server or don't find me a server. So here's the, here's the source address. So um, that was IGMP. But now once the gateway gets to know about the members, once he gets to know that somebody has joined the multicast group address, it's the gateway's job to find the server. How does R3 know that R7 is the gateway or R7 is the server? How does R3 know? The only thing he R3 knows is that R1 is a member through IGMP. But how does R3 know R7 is the server? That's the job of PIM, protocol independent multicast. That's the job of PIM to find the server if I'm using IGMP version two to find the server. Now, obviously in PIM, there are different um, mechanisms to, um, to basically find the server. One is we have dense mode, we have sparse mode, and we have a combination which is sparse dense. So let's talk about the dense mode first. Now, dense mode is basically, it uses technologies of flooding and pruning. So as soon as the gateway R3 gets to know about the IGMP join message, and that join message contains star comma G, which means find me a server, R3 is going to start sending PIM messages. 
And that if I'm using dense mode, it uses technology of flooding and pruning. So think of flooding and pruning. Um, I don't know if you guys remember in VTP, uh, VLAN trunking protocol, in VTP, there was something called as VTP pruning. It works exactly the same way. If you remember VTP pruning, that if I don't have an active VLAN, I don't send broadcast requests for that VLAN on that switch. But if I have somebody active for that VLAN, I would send, I would not send a prune message. Same thing happens in dense mode, that every router is going to flood by default. And if I don't have a client, I would send back a prune message to the upstream device that, hey, I don't have a client, so don't send me this multicast stream address or don't send me multicast because I don't have a client. So in dense mode, it works on flooding and pruning. So assumingly, I was PIM enabled on all the routers. As soon as the IGMP message comes here, this is IGMP comes here, R3 begins PIM. So let's say if I was using dense mode, R3 is going to flood the star comma G. So initially I'm flooding what? I'm flooding the star comma G. I don't know who the server is. So I'm just going to flood my star comma G request using PIM. So star comma G and star comma G. I'm just gonna flood that, hey, is there a server for this group? I'm gonna flood this to R2, R4 and R6. R2 would flood it here he would flood it here, he would flood it back here also. R4 would flood it back here, here, here. R6 would flood it here and here and here. So there is no, um, if I use the word, it's not like it's not, if I'm sending it to you, you don't send it back to me. It's actually sending it everywhere. So on any PIM enabled interface, Whichever interfaces has PIM enabled, I would flood it there. So using flooding, the server gets to know that, hey, there is a client somewhere. There is a client somewhere. As soon as the server gets to know about the star comma G request, he sends back a stop message. Stop. Why is he sending stop? because the gateway R3 is going crazy. He's constantly flooding star comma G because the reason he's flooding star comma G is because he doesn't know who the server is. So he's constantly sending uh, star comma G requests. And it's not that it uses a lot of bandwidth. The star comma G is it's not a multicast stream. So it's not, it's not an actual multicast stream. So it's just a request. So it doesn't take any bandwidth. It probably would be less than 1K. So it's just sending requests constantly throughout the internet. So as soon as the server gets to know the star comma G, he floods back a stop message and that flooding of stop message goes everywhere again. So um, it goes everywhere on all the routers. And that's how when R3 gets the stop message back, that's when R3 stops flooding. Basically the server is saying, Stop flooding, I know that you need multicast. Because earlier R3 was just flooding, he doesn't know who the server is and server doesn't know that he has to start sending multicast. So R3 is just flooding. As soon as the server gets to know that, um, that a multicast request, multicast stream needs to be started, he first sends a stop message to tell everyone on the internet to stop flooding for this group address. I'm gonna start my stream. So the star comma G is sent without any prunes. So there is no prune for star comma G. The S comma G is the actual multicast stream that will have a prune also. So what happens for S comma G? S comma G will come from here. So it comes from the server, that's your actual multicast stream. Source is this R7 and group would be your multicast group address. So S comma G is coming from the R7 to R5. When R5 gets it, he needs to forward that multicast stream to all his PIM enabled interface. So however, before he forwards it to his PIM enabled interface, he does a RPF check, reverse forwarding check. 
So he does an RPF check for that on which interface did I receive the multicast stream? I received the multicast stream on gig 1.57. And from who did, it, did I receive the multicast stream? I received the multicast stream from R7. R7 is the source, R7. And the group would probably be something, let's say 229.1.1.1. So I received a multicast stream from R7, whose IP address is this, for this multicast group address on this interface. So PIM, before he can forward it out to his outbound interfaces to other neighbors, he does an RPF check, reverse path forwarding check. And PIM would do an RPF check against his routing table. Now, one thing that you must always remember, that's the key point for multicast. PIM and IGP, they work hand in hand. PIM always takes the path by default of the IGP. So if your PIM path and your IGP path is the same, then you will never have a problem in multicast. But if your PIM path and your IGP path is different, then you would definitely have a problem in multicast. I'll explain that a bit in a few, few minutes, how that happens. But let's say I have PIM dense mode enabled on all the interfaces in this diagram. So R5, when he gets the multicast stream, he would do an RPF check, reverse path forwarding check, and he checks his routing table. If I have to get back to R7, how do I get back? What does my routing table say? The routing table will say, to get back to R7, use the outbound interface as gig 1.57. Is that the interface on which I received the PIM packet? Yes, which means RPF check passed. So if your interface on which you received the PIM packet and the interface which IGP uses to go back to R7, if it's the same, RPF check passes and you can forward it out to other interfaces. So RPF check passes and now R5 floods to R2, R to R6, and to R4. Now let's assume that the best path as per IGP is the path between R1, R4, R5, and R7. That's the best path as per IGP. So when R5 forwards it to R2, R4, and R6, because IGP's best path is this path, R2 would respond back with a prune message. So R2 would send a prune message back, prune, saying, I don't have a client, don't send me multicast stream, which means the multicast stream going towards R2 will stop. R6 will send back a prune message. I don't have a client attached to me. So he sends a prune message back. So this multicast stream stops here. R4 does not send a prune message. The reason he does not send because he has somebody on downstream R3 who's requesting for multicast. So he doesn't send a prune message, which means the multicast stream will go towards R4. When R4 gets it, he does an RPF check again on gig 1.45. I received the multicast stream on gig 1.45. How do I go back to R7 as per IGP? Do I use the same interface as the outbound interface to go to R7? Yes, RPF check passes and he forwards it down to R3. R3 does an RPF check again. I received it on gig 1.34. How does, what does my routing table say? How do I get back to R7? If this is the best path, no problem. RPF check passes. And now R3 forwards the multicast stream to R1. And that's how R1 gets the multicast stream. That's dense mode. So it's pretty straightforward and simple, dense mode. But dense mode is something that you would never find anywhere on the internet. You may find that in the enterprise. Nowadays, in fact, nobody uses dense mode. It's just too much of bandwidth being utilized unnecessary because it's flooding. So if I don't know who the server is, there's a flood of uh, multicast. And initially, even initially, if you see R5 
send the multicast stream on to R2 also, R4 also, and R6 also. After that, a prune message came, which means initially the multicast stream is going on all the routers, like flooding it everywhere, which means a lot of bandwidth would be utilized initially. After I get the prune message, yes, the bandwidth would be optimized. So, but dense mode is something that you would never have on the internet. You would never find any ISP saying, hey, I support dense mode. No, you would never have that. You would always be using sparse mode. That, that was dense mode. So not good because it's flooding. Obviously sparse mode was better because fast, uh, sparse mode does not use flooding and pruning. It has something called as run the whoop point. See, why was I flooding? Because I don't know who the server is. That's why I'm flooding. So if I just flood everywhere, think of it this way. Like, imagine if I want to meet, um, I'll give you a very simple, it's a stupid example, but think of it this way. Let's say if I want to meet a person uh, whose name is Rohit. So I am this mad guy who, who gets out of my house and every human being I meet, I ask him, are you Rohit? He says, no, I move on. Are you Rohit? I move on. What's going to happen eventually? At some point of time, I would bump into some guy called Rohit. It's the same concept. I'm just like flooding everywhere on all the routers throughout the internet, somewhere on the internet, one guy is going to respond back saying, hey, I'm the server for this multicast group address. So that's what happens here in flooding. I'm just going crazy, flooding across on all the routers, across everywhere in your enterprise network or on the internet. That's why you would never find dense mode being supported by any ISP because you're just flooding. You're flooding and, and the entire, everybody is going to be affected because of your flooding. So, you don't really need that. So with the uh, sparse mode, it was optimized that there was no flooding and pruning. So how does R3, the gateway, when he gets to know about IGMP, the join message, how does he know where to find the server from? Earlier, I was flooding and finding the server, but now because I'm using sparse mode, there is no flooding. So how do I find the server? That's where rendezvous point comes in, RP, um, RP becomes mandatory or compulsory, however you may say it, it becomes mandatory for it to be present if you want sparse mode to work, unless you're using IGMP version three and source specific multicast, then you don't need rendezvous point. But if you're using IGMP version two, and if you're running sparse mode as PIM, then you require a rendezvous point. So rendezvous point is, could be any router on the internet, or it could be any router in your enterprise network. Uh, obviously it has to be reachable by everyone. So what's going to happen with sparse mode is uh, let's say if R2 is the rendezvous point, R2 is maybe loop back, is the rendezvous point. So when an IGMP message comes here, this is IGMP, let's say version two, we don't use version one. When R3 registers a client, PIM begins. Now earlier R3 was flooding, flooding what? Star comma G to find the server. Now R3 will not flood. He will send the star comma G to the rendezvous point. So star comma G. That's your PIM request. Um, star comma G request is going to the rendezvous point. So every router on the internet or within your enterprise network, they all need to know who the rendezvous point is. If the rendezvous point is not known, multicast stream gets dropped. So since R3 knows who the rendezvous point is, he sends the star comma G directed towards the rendezvous point. The rendezvous point will have all the servers registered to himself. So whichever servers are there, they basically register with the rendezvous point. 
Now, as soon as the star comma G comes to the rendezvous point, the rendezvous point is going to tell R1 that, hey, he is the server because R, um, R2, who is the rendezvous point, knows who the server is because all the servers are registered with the rendezvous point. So R3, the gateway, sends the star comma G towards the rendezvous point asking him, who is the server for this multicast group address? Rendezvous point responds back saying, hey, the server is R7. Now your request is directly going to the server saying, hey, I need multicast. And now your server starts his star comma S comma G. The S comma G, initially the first packet of your S comma G would go from here to our two, to the rendezvous point and then to the client. That's the first multicast packet. Then what's going to happen is that once R1 sends the request directly to R7, that, hey, I got to know from the rendezvous point that you are the server, I'm the client, can you send it to me? So what's gonna happen, it's going to switch from a shared tree to a direct tree, which means that the server is now going to send the multicast stream directly to the client. It doesn't need to transit the rendezvous point. The rendezvous point was only for the star comma G. It was not for S comma G. So to find the server, I'm, I'm, I'm directing my star comma G towards the rendezvous point. The rendezvous point knows the server. So he tells the server that, hey, send the multicast stream towards me, the rendezvous point to, to, for me to give it to the client. So the first multicast stream goes from server to rendezvous point to the client. And then once the client gets to know who the server is from the rendezvous point, he sends a direct request to the server and so will start a directory towards the client. It doesn't need to transit the rendezvous point. So that is your sparse mode, highly optimized um, because it's not flooding anymore. Now the question comes is, how do I tell all the routers that who the rendezvous point is? There are mechanisms for that. So I could go and tell every router statically that, hey, I am the rendezvous point or he is the rendezvous point. I could statically go and assign a rendezvous point on every router. Now imagine if I have thousands of routers, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work to go on every router, log in, maybe Telnet or SSH, log into them, configure uh, a rendezvous point statically. It's like, imagine you going and configuring a static route on thousand routers. It's going to take a lot of time. So obviously there has to be a better way to do that. A better way to do that would be, I use something called as auto RP announcement. So automatic rendezvous point announcement. So instead of me statically going to every router, I go to R2 and I tell R2, hey, why don't you announce yourself to everyone that I am the RP? So that's done using auto RP. The problem with that is that auto RP requires you to, um, to announce itself, it, it needs to flood. Sparse mode does not flood. It doesn't support flooding, which means I need to switch my PIM mechanism to sparse dense mode. So since initially the RP is not known and because the interface supports sparse dense, which is the third mechanism of PIM, sparse dense, What's going to happen, R2 is going to flood to everyone that I am the RP. Once everybody knows about the RP, sparse mode begins. So you may think, isn't that good? It's not. Because since your interface supports sparse dense mode, yes, initially RP announcement is going to be flooded. But once everybody knows the RP, yes, the multicast stream is going to use sparse mode, which is nice. The problem happens is when the rendezvous point goes down. If the rendezvous point goes down or is not reachable for some reason, 
because your interface supports dense mode, multicast dense mode begins, which means your actual multicast stream is going to be flooded. Do you want that? No, I rather drop the multicast than go dense mode because dense mode can bring your entire enterprise network down because it's eating up your bandwidth really fast. So you don't want dense mode. So the problem with sparse dense mode, well, advantage was yes, I could use auto RP and announce to everyone that I am the RP. The disadvantage was that if RP goes down, dense mode begins for multicast, for multicast stream. You don't want that. So there was another tweak which could be done to use auto RP with just sparse mode. So I could use auto RP with just sparse mode. The problem with that was that I have to go to every router and configure him to be an auto RP listener which is not enabled by default for some reason. It's not. So that beats the purpose of me statically going and configuring on every router. See, why did auto RP come in? Because I didn't want to go to thousand routers and configure statically who the RP is. That's where auto RP came in. But when auto RP came in, I required it to be sparse dense mode, which was bad. So they came up with a tweak saying, okay, let's use auto RP with sparse mode only so that your traffic, your multicast stream never goes dense. But to support uh, auto RP in sparse mode only, you require this one command on all the thousand routers, which is IP PIM auto RP listener. So if I'm giving one command on every router, all the thousand routers, it beats the purpose of auto RP because I could just go and give one static route or static RP announcement or static RP configuration on every router. It beats the purpose. That's where uh, bootstrap router BSR, uh, which is also known as PIM version two came in where I could announce myself as the RP without the auto RP listener command and use only sparse mode. That was bootstrap router or PIM version two. So this, these are the mechanics or the basics of how multicast really works. So what I'm going to do now is to demonstrate and to show you some um, like the multicast routing table and how you see the star comma G, how you see the S comma G. To demonstrate that, we would now start off configuring multicast. So like I said earlier, IP addressing has been pre-configured and OSPF has been pre-configured as the IGP. And uh, <clears throat> let me quickly show you the routing table. So if I look at R7, which is going to be my server, if I do I show IP route OSPF, I have all the routes R1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I have all the routers, all the loopbacks. If I do a trace route to 1111, sourcing from my loopback, this is my IGP best path. So let me go and do. I should have done numeric. So yeah, I mean, if I look at uh, my best path, my best path is from R7 to R5 to six to three to one. So, <clears throat> so my best path right now as per IGP is going from here to here to here to here to here. That's my best path as of right now. <clears throat> Now, as long as you have PIM enabled on this path, which is from here to here, to here, to here, as long as you have PIM enabled on that path, you will never have a problem. So if your IGP path and the PIM enabled path is the same, absolutely no problem. 
But let's say if I enabled PIM on only this path and your best path as per IGP was this path, then you will have a problem. Right now, I'll just enable PIM on all the interfaces of all the routers and we'll see what happens. So obviously if we have PIM everywhere, all the interfaces support PIM, then you will never have a problem. So let me go back to the router. And I'll start first with R1, who's going to be my client. So the first thing what I'm going to do is because R1 is a router, I'm emulating him to be a client. I must enable multicast routing here also. I have to enable that, but let's say if this was an actual PC or a client, I don't need multicast to be enabled or PIM to be enabled, but because I'm emulating this on a router, uh, you have to enable multicast routing and also PIM on the router. So let's say I go to my interface, gig 1.13, and I would say IP PIM, let's say dense mode. I'm gonna use dense mode first. And now I would, I would send a request saying join a group. So IP IGMP join group, Let's say I join the multicast group address called 229.7.7.7. So now R1, who's a client, has joined a multicast group address. So he is now going to send like a broadcast to all the devices in this broadcast domain that, hey, I have joined the multicast group address called 229.7.7.7. I don't know who the server is. Can anyone find a server for me? So it's a star comma G. So if I look at show IP M route, can you see there's a star comma G here? This is the routing table of multicast. There's a star comma G and it's flooding, it's forwarding to the interface gig 1.13. So whoever, whichever routers are there in that segment or whichever devices are there in that segment would hear about the multicast. If I look at my IGMP message, show IP IGMP membership, you would see that he has joined a multicast group address. Who has, uh, who is the reporter or who's the client? 10131. Now can R3, who's the default gateway here, does he get to know about that R1 is a client and he's joined the multicast group address? Let's go to R3 and do a show IP IGMP membership. If I go and do here, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. I don't see any membership. I should be seeing. But the reason I don't see that is because R3 does not have multicast enabled. He doesn't have PIM enabled. He must have PIM enabled to, to listen to IGMP messages. So I'm gonna go back to R3 and say IP multicast routing, distributed and go to my interface gig 1.13 and uh, something happened. Okay. Um, IP PIM dense mode. Okay. Once I enable dense mode, and if I do a show IP IGMP membership, you would you would see that R three the gateway has now heard about somebody some client joining a multicast group address, which you can see here that R3 now knows that R1 is a client for this multicast group address, okay? Now, obviously for him to send the, uh, the, the request ahead, he needs PIM on all the interfaces. So obviously I need PIM on all the interfaces to be configured. Let me do that also. I believe I have three more interfaces, which is towards R4, towards R2, towards R6. So interface gig one dot, um, I believe it's 23, IP PIM dense mode, uh, 34, dense mode, and 36, dense mode. So now I've enabled dense mode on all the interfaces. Let me go to R2 also and enable multicast routing, distributed, Gig 1.23, IP PIM dense mode. Then I have 25 dense mode. I believe it's 24 dense mode. 
Let me go to R4. So I'm basically enabled PIM everywhere. The IGMP join message, I only gave on R1. But multicast routing and PIM, I enabled on all the interfaces and all the routers. But join message was only on R1, on the interface towards R3. So IP multicast routing, distributed, gig 1.24. IP PIM dense mode, I believe it's 34 dense mode, then 45 dense mode and 46 dense mode. So R4 is ready. Let's go to R5. Gig 1.25. It's 45 and 56 and 57 towards R7, dense mode. So six, five is ready. Let's also configure six. IP multicast routing distributed. Okay, R6 is ready and last is going to be R7, which is my server. So IP multicast routing distributed and interface gig 1.57 IP PIM dense mode. So now I've configured dense mode on all the interfaces. The first thing that you would do is just from verification perspective, you should always do a show IP PIM neighbors just to check who your neighbors are. Now, how many neighbors should I find on R7? One neighbor, R5. How many neighbors should I see on R5? R2, R4, R6, and R7. So four neighbors on R5, I should see. Show IP PIM neighbors. I should see four neighbors, which I do. That's just from verification perspective that I have configured PIM on, on every router, uh, on every interface. So now coming back to are actual multicast working. So right now what I've configured, I've enabled multicast routing on all the routers globally. I've enabled PIM dense mode on all the interfaces as per this diagram. And on R1, additionally, I have configured IP IGMP join group 229.7.7.7. So now what's happening is R1 is sending a broadcast saying, hey, I have joined the multicast group address, star comma, 229.7.7.7. R3 years about the join message. Will R2, R4, R5, R6, R7 hear about the IGMP? No. You remember I said that IGMP is only within the broadcast domain. It does not go outside. So if I go to R2 and do a show IP IGMP membership, you will not see anything about 229.7.7.7. Only R3 knows about that the client has joined a multicast group address. Only R3 knows, which means IGMP is only till R3 within that broadcast domain. Now, once R3 gets to know about the member, what does he do? PIM begins. He starts flooding using PIM, not IGMP. He's using PIM to flood across all the interfaces. So if I look at my M route now, let's say if I go to R2 and do a show IP M route for, uh, let's try doing a 229.7.7.7. I don't see anything right now, obviously, because this is an emulation. But if I go to R3 and do a show IP M route, can you see he is flooding star comma G. He is flooding star comma G on all the interfaces using dense mode. So now R3 is flooding across all the interfaces. Using flooding, R3 uh, will find the server. Now, obviously, because I don't have an actual application on R7 who's responding to multicast star comma G, 
I would not find the M route of star comma G on all the routers right now. I have to actually emulate the ping or maybe send a multicast stream. So I'm gonna to go to R7 just to show you how it works. Go to R7 and do a ping to 229.7.7.7. Let's say repeat 1000 or 10,000. My ping should work and I should get a response from R1. Who's my client? Can you see I got a response from R1, which means my multicast stream is working. And let me now show you the star comma G on R2. Earlier I was not seeing it. Now I should see it, star comma G. What do I see here? Can you see it's forwarding it to all interfaces? There's no pruning. It's forwarding to all interfaces. I got the star comma G from R3 by flooding and I'm sending it back to R3 also, R5 also, R4 also. And I also see a message called stopped, which you can see here also. This basically means that the server sent a stop message back saying stop flooding, stop flooding multicast or star comma G. I am sending an S comma G, which is the actual multicast stream. Now, how is he sending the S comma G? The ping, the echo request. I'm not pinging an IP address. I'm pinging a multicast group address, which means my echo is being sent as a multicast to the multicast group address. And whoever's a member of that, uh, in that multicast group address would, would basically get that information. So how is the multicast going? Let's go to R5 and do a show IP M route for 229.7.7.7. Look at the S comma G. This is the S comma G. That's your actual multicast stream. This is not your multicast stream. That's just a request to find the server. This is your actual multicast stream. And my data inside the multicast is my echo ping. So what is happening here? So R5 received multicast stream incoming interface from gig 1.57. RPF check passed because I see the outgoing interface as per IGP as 10.157.7. Let's say if I could do an IGP check, uh, show IP route 10.1.57.7. It says go out via this interface as per IGP, which means that the RPF check passed and now he can forward to other interfaces. Now he can only forward to PIM enabled interface. So does he forward to R2? No, because he received a prune from R2. Does he forward to R4? No, because he received a prune from R4. Does he forward to R6? Yes, because he did not receive a prune from R6. So he forwards to R6. What does R6 get? He won't have IGMP membership. IGMP membership is only with R3. But if I look at my routing table, show IP M route 229.7.7.7. Look at the S comma G. Incoming interface was from R5. And as per my IGP, outgoing interface to R7, show IP route 10.157.7 is via OSPF. Outgoing interface is 56. And is my incoming interface PIM packet received was the same interface? Yes. So incoming interface is compared with the outgoing interface of IGP. So as per IGP to reach back to the source, IGP says use this interface. And is this matching the incoming interface on which PIM was received? Yes. RPF check passes. And now he can forward it down to which one, either to R3 or to R4. Now from R4, he received a prune. So he does not forward to R4, he forwards to R3. R3 receives that, let's go to R3. So R3 receives incoming interface 36, RPF check passes, and he forwards towards client R1. That's how the client gets the echo request and client responds back to the multicast group address with a reply. And that's how it goes back to the server. That's, how, that's why I see the reply. This is PIM dense mode. Now there's absolutely no problem right now from perspective of my multicast working. There's no problem because I have PIM enabled on all the interfaces 
And I also have PIM enabled on the IGP path, so no problem. Let me show you something where multicast can fail and why it would fail. Let's say I'm gonna to go to, uh, let's try enforcing that my PIM, my IGP path is this. So I'm gonna to go to this interface, this interface, this interface, and this interface. I'll go and increase my OSPF cost, which means that from R3 to get back to R7, this is the only best path. Other paths have higher cost. And from R5 to get back to R1, this is the only best path through R2 or through R4, it's a higher OSPF cost. Let me first do that, which means we are enforcing that my IGP path is from seven to five to six to three to one. So I'm gonna go back to R5. Big 1.25, IP OSPF cost, let's say 10,000. And IP OSPF cost on 45 as 10,000 which means if I look at my routing table, I should see all paths using 56. Okay, let's go to R3 also. See earlier, I was probably doing load balancing. So if you see to go to five, I was doing load balancing on all three interfaces because the cost was same. Now I'm gonna go back to R3 on 23 and say IP OSPF cost 10,000 and gig 1.34 cost 10,000. So now if I look at my routing table, I only have one best path, which is through R6, which you can see through 36. So all paths are through, through that interface. So now I have a fixed IGP path. Do I have PIM enabled on that path? Yes, no problem. A quick way to troubleshoot is go to your client and go to your server. So let's say I go to my client and I do a trace route to the server, 10.157.7, I do a trace route. What's my path? It's going to three, to six, to five, to seven. That's my IGP path. Then do a trace, uh, do a M trace route, so M trace to the server's address again, 10.157.7, okay? I believe there's no numeric in this, yeah. This path should be the same as per IGP path. If that's the same, you will not have a problem in multicast. Your multicast is going to work. So I see one, two, going to, it should go to three. So it's going, going to three. From three, it should go towards six. This is my incoming, I receive from R1 going towards R3. This is my outgoing interface. So it's going to six. From six is going to go towards the outbound interface of R6, which is towards R5. Towards R5. And then from R5, it should go to R7. So my, the, my PIM path and IGP path is the same. So absolutely no problem. Like I said, the problem comes in if the IGP path and PIM path is different. So now what I'm going to do is just on this link between five and six, I will disable PIM, which means PIM is not enabled on the primary IGP path. Okay, so if I go back to let's say R7, my ping is working, right? I'm gonna go back to R6 now. And gig 1.56 say no IP PIM dense mode. So I've disabled PIM. On that link, is my multicast still working? Let's check. It started getting dropped. My multicast stream is getting dropped now. Why is multicast not taking an alternate path? Because like I said, PIM always takes the path of IGP. So now my IGP path 
is from R5 to R6 to R3 to R1. But PIM cannot take that path because there's no PIM enabled on that path. So it tries to take an alternate path, but the alternate path will have an RPF failure because obviously I don't have, um, um, I don't have PIM. So let me show you that. If I now go back to R1 and do an IGP trace again, IGP path hasn't been affected. When I disable PIM, it only stopped multicast. My IGP never changed. IGP is still taking the part of R1 to R3 to R6 to R5 to R7. But if I do my M trace, let's see what happens here now. So no problem up till R1's outbound interface. It reached R3. From R3, outbound interface is R6. And there's PIM enabled there on that interface. So no problem there. It reached R6, incoming interface 36.6, which is the link between three and six. Outbound interface, it says no route which means my outbound interface link, which is six to five, has a problem. So my PIM is trying to take this path. Why is he taking this path? Because of IGP, IGP takes this path. So even PIM is gonna take that path. So he went from here to here, here to here. Till here, there was no problem. Outbound interface has a problem. There's no route there, which means there is no PIM enabled there which means RPF must have failed. How do I confirm that? If I go to R6, if I go to R6 and do a show IP M route for 229.7.7.7, let's see. Can you see there's no um, star S comma G? There's no S comma G here. Let's do a show IP RPF for 10.1.57.7, which is my server, where the multicast stream is coming from the server, right? I do a show IP RPF for the server's address. What does it say? Failed. RPF check failed. Why is that? Because the multicast stream coming from the server cannot come on that interface. It's not able to come on that interface because there's no PIM enabled. So RPF check must have failed. So obviously because my PIM path and IGP path is not the same, uh, I'm going to have a problem. How do I fix this? There are multiple ways of fixing this. Obviously I'm not going to get into the BGP part. One is via BGP. You could fix that with multicast BGP um, or I could fix this with a static route static M route, multicast static route. So what I could do is um, let's go to R5. And in fact, let's go to R6. I could go and say IP M route 10.1.57.7, which is our, my server, 255.255.255.255. Uh, it's okay to receive multicast on this link instead of this link. Because obviously R5 cannot send multicast on this interface. Why? Because there's no PIM neighborship there. So he forwards it to R4. R4 gives it to maybe R6 or maybe R3, whichever R4's best path is. Uh, when If he gives it to R6, R6 would drop the multicast stream because for him, the best path is through R5 as per IGP and he's receiving the multicast stream on the link from R4. So he's going to drop that packet because RPF check fails. So I could go and say, it's okay to receive from 172.16, I believe it's 46.4. So I made... Uh, a static entry for that. So if I now do a show IP RPF for 10.157.7, I see that I have a static M route configured 
which says that to get back to R7, use the outbound interface as R4. So don't take the IGP path for multicast, which by default it takes, takes take another path, which has PIM enabled. So by default, without an M route, PIM is trying to take the IGP path, but that IGP path is broken because there's no PIM between five and six. So now I'm telling him statically saying, hey, don't take the IGP path, take this path through R4 to, to get packets, for, to go back to R7, the server. If I see now my ping has started working now because I fixed the M route, I fixed my uh, PIM path. So now I'm not taking the path through uh, IGP. I'm taking my, my, my multicast is going from, if I actually go to R7, let me in fact show you that. So if I do a trace route, my IGP path to the client, 10, 1, 13, 1, my IGP path is still through R6. This is my IGP path. I believe it is 10, 1, show IP route or SPF. 10, 1, yeah, it's ping. What did I give? I give 13, so 10, 1, 3, 1. So this is my IGP path from seven to five to six to three to one. So from server to client, it's taking the IGP path. That's my IGP trace route. But if I do M trace route to 10, 1, 3, 1, the client, I'm not taking the IGP path anymore. I'm going from seven to five. From five, I may go to four. From four, I may go to six. And from six, I may go to three. And from three, I may go to the client. So we'll see which path he's taking. So he went from five, from seven towards five. Their PIM is enabled. Let's see where five goes. Five would not send it to six because six has PIM broken. So he sends to, in fact, he sent to six. He did send it to six. Let's see what six is doing. Six has PIM multicast disabled, which shows here. But because of my static M route, it can take an alternate path. And from three, it went to it went to R3, PIM multicast. So it's going towards basically R3. So this was basically dense mode. So dense mode is something pretty straightforward. Um, you will not have RPF check issues if you have PIM enabled on all the interfaces, absolutely no problem. But if you have PIM enabled on a specific list of interfaces, then ensure that your IGP and PIM path is the same. If they're not the same, you'll have to fix your, your PIM path with M routes or using BGP. Again, for if you want to learn about how to do it via BGP, I believe I do have a video for that in the CCI service provider uh, videos. I believe there's a multicast using BGP. I'm fixing M routes using BGP in that. But obviously this is multicast basics, so I won't get into that. All right, so let's go back to R6 and remove that M route. I'm just gonna go and change this to sparse mode now. I'll remove this, I'll go back and add my 56 with PIM sparse mode now. So now all my interfaces will be running sparse mode. Gig 1.56, 46, and 36. Let's go to R7. Big 1.57. I'm changing it to sparse mode now. I did all of them. So 
five, six, and seven is done. Four. Three. And two. Twenty five, twenty four. And lastly, R1. I believe I configured R3 also. I forgot one interface, gig 1.13, IP PIM, sparse mode. So now I've configured sparse mode on all the routers. My PIM path and IGP path is the same, so no problem. My multicast should work. Let's check. Ping. It should work, but is it working? No. Why is it not working? You remember I said that um, sparse mode does not use flooding and pruning. It requires a rendezvous point. Do I have a rendezvous point? No. If rendezvous point is not known, multicast packet gets dropped it gets dropped. Let's see that. <clears throat> so if I go to, let's say any router R3, I still have the IP IGMP membership. R3 knows that R1 has uh, joined a multicast group address, which you can see here. But now what does he do with the star comma G? So if I do a show IPM route, I have a star comma G entry, right? Where does he need to forward that? Earlier he was flooding, but now I'm using sparse mode. So there's no flooding there. So what is he going to do with that? He needs to send that directed towards a rendezvous point. Do I know who the rendezvous point is? No, I don't know. So I dropped the Mantika stream. I dropped the star comma G. Server would never know that there's a client who has joined because server is registered with the rendezvous point, but the star comma G never reaches the rendezvous point because R3 drops the, the star comma G because there's no rendezvous point. Let's make R2 into a rendezvous point. Now, again, as of right now, as per my IGP, because I configured OSPF cost, my IGP best path is this. That's my IGP best path. R2 is nowhere in the picture for IGP path. But I will configure R2 as a rendezvous point. So on all the routers, I will go and say statically, you remember I said that you can define the rendezvous point statically on all the thousand routers, or I could use auto RP. So what I will do is go to every router and give one command, IP PIM RP mapping or RP address is 2.2.2.2. So R2's loopback is the RP. Let's give this command on all the routers to Six. So this is one command that you have to do in all the routers. Imagine if I have thousand routers, I have to do this on thousand devices. That's why auto RP is better. But problem with auto RP is that it requires sparse tense mode. 
That's why BIM version 2 or BSR is even better. Okay, so now I have RP information everywhere. Let's look at the show IPM route. Show IPM route 229.7.7.7. So I have the star comma G, correct? I have the star comma G and RP is R2. If I look at R2 now, show IP MRA 229.7.7.7. Let's say we have a detail. No, so okay. I have a star comma G entry. So everybody has a star comma G entry for the, um, for that multicast group address. And if you see here, R2 himself uh, has the star comma G entry. I believe R5 should have that. Show IP MRAD. There's a star comma G here. So everybody has that basically. Let's do a ping and see. So maybe I can do, let's try. Let's try a ping to 29.7.7.7, repeat 10,000. Okay, look at the star, the star comma G entry, S comma G entry on R5. Show IPM route 229.7.7.7. Look at the S comma G was received and it's going towards R6. So my directory is being built from R7 towards R1 using the IGP part. It doesn't need to transit R2 because the client and server have met at the rendezvous point at the star comma G because the star comma G from R3 was sent towards RP and servers registered with the RP. So client and server can meet there and then server sends directly to uh, the client. So if you see it's sending to R6, it's not sending it to R2 anymore. So when the star comma G is going towards the rendezvous point, the S comma G is, is basically building a directory from server to client. It doesn't need to transit the RP unless RP is in the IGP path. And my multicast stream should work. It is working. So this is working perfectly without me actually flooding across, which dense mode is bad because it's flooding. Now, obviously this becomes inconvenient because I'm actually um, doing statically on all the routers, thousand routers, statically configuring all of that. That kind of becomes uh, inconvenient, so we could use auto RP. But like I said, the problem with auto RP is that it requires sparse dense mode. Unless if I want to use auto RP with just sparse mode, then I could go and let me in fact show you. Stop this first. All right, let me go to R2 and ask R2. So first I will go, let me go back here and say send commands to all sessions. And let's do config T and no IP PIM RP mapping or RP address. To that, to that, to that too. So I have removed the static RP configuration from all the routers. Now I will go to our just R2 and I'll ask him to you announce yourself. So IP PIM, the command is IP PIM send RP, announce yourself, announce your loopback as that as if you're the RP to a scope of let's say 16 hops. It requires PIM to be enabled on the loopback. So let's go back to the loopback and say IP PIM sparse mode and say, Announce yourself. So now R2 is going to start announcing himself that I am the RP. 
On which address is he going to announce? Let's see that. Show IPM route. He starts announcing that I am the RP on this address, 224.0.1.39. What is this? It's a multicast address. So basically I am announcing that I am the RP as a multicast. And for you to understand multicast, you need to know the RP information first. So it's a chicken or egg situation. What comes first? I don't know who the RP is, so how can I understand multicast? But you are announcing yourself as multicast. So when you use auto RP or you announce yourself, by default, it announces on this address as a multicast address. But nobody would understand that because I need to know who the RP is first to understand the multicast. So that's where you have a mapping agent who maps the multicast address, which RP is announcing to an address that all routers are members of by default. Can you see this show IP IGMP membership? Can you see that all routers are by default members of this group? 224.0.1.39. All routers are members of this. The minute I enable PIM on an interface, on that interface, I become a member by default of this group. So this group, they can understand without RP information. So what I need is I need a mapping agent, like a translator. It's like you speaking Chinese and, I'm, and me speaking English. We both can understand each other. So I have a translator who speaks both the language. So I have a mapping agent who understands 39 and he will translate 39 to 40. So everybody else can understand. The mapping agent could be the same router, R2, or it could be a different router. That's up to you. I'll make R2 itself into a mapping agent. So I go back to R2 and say IP, PIM, send RP discovery loopback zero. Or maybe I'll, I won't use loopback zero, let's use a physical interface. Or maybe I'll use a separate loopback, let's make a new loopback. Interface loopback one, just to see the difference. Uh, let's give the IP address as 22, 22, 22, 22, 255, 255, 255, 255, IP PIM sparse mode. And then let's say IP PIM Send RP discovery loop back one, scope 16. So if you look at, I gave two commands. I gave announce, which is announcing himself as the RP and discovery is the translator who is converting 39 to 40. Look at the difference now in the M route. So look at the star comma G. The star comma G is the RP announcer who is saying, I am the RP, but nobody understands that. Now, mm -hmm. um, so if you see the RP who's look back zero, the announcer, he's announcing himself on this address. Nobody understands that. So then the mapping agent should be converting that and announcing that RP is loopback zero. Let's see. I should see, see this here, loopback one. So loopback one, which is the mapping agent is shouting out to everyone on the address, which everybody understands, saying that the RP, RP is loopback zero or 2.2.2.2. If I look back at any other router, let's say R3 and do a show IP PIM RP mapping, I should see that announcement, but I don't see it. Why is that? You remember I said auto RP requires sparse dense mode because it needs to flood that information. But because I don't have sparse dense mode, it's not going to learn. So I need one command to be given on all the thousand routers, which is IP PIM auto RP listener. But this beats the purpose Instead of me then doing auto RP, I could just give one command static M route or static RP information on all the thousand routers. Because anyway, I'm giving thousand commands, auto RP listener 
on all the routers. So I could just do it statically then. It just beats the purpose. That's why we have PIM version two, which is BSR. That works on, um, on sparse mode. So for that, I don't need auto RP listener. All I do is go back to R2 and I remove this discovery command. I remove the auto RP, I believe it was the announce. I remove this, I don't do this. Instead I do IP PIM RP candidate loopback zero, which is the announcer and then IP PIM BSR candidate loopback one, which is the mapping agent. Now all routers will learn about it on sparse mode. I don't need auto RP listener. So you see just two commands on one router and everybody knows about the RP. So if I go back to R3 now and do a show IP PIM RP mapping, you would learn that loopback zero is the RP and who gave me this information? Loopback one. So 2.2.2.2 is the RP and information was learned. Info source is loopback one. And who is the RP? 2.2.2.2, learned via bootstrap, which is also known as PIM version two. Everybody would learn about this. So if I look at R7 also, show IP PIM RP mapping. I should have learned that, Every, 16 hops basically. Which I have. So things to remember if you have, um, if you're using auto RP or bootstrap, uh, make sure you verify your PIM path. PIM path and IGP path should be the same for the source. PIM path and IGP path should be the same for the RP address. PIM path and IGP path should be the same for the mapping agent also. If either of the three is not uh, the same, then obviously your multicast would stop working. Because think about it. Who is telling me who the RP is? Mapping agent, which means my RPF failure should not happen for the mapping agent. Otherwise I will not know who the RP is. So your PIM path and IGP path towards the mapping agent should be same. And um, who is telling the mapping agent that I am the RP, the RP himself, which means the mapping agent towards the RP candidate, uh, PIM, uh, your PIM path and IGP path should be the same. Otherwise RPF failure would happen. Otherwise mapping agent won't know who the RP is. And then for the actual multicast stream, your PIM path and IGP path from the source should be the same. Otherwise multicast would fail. So this is basically multicast basics. Obviously there's a lot more that you can do with multicast, but this is something that you should know. And this is the basics. So what I'm going to do now is I will answer some of your questions. Let me go back and see what questions we have. Um, I see one question here which says, can you run and is a good practice to set up multicast between two routers point to point? I mean, there's no reason to run. If you have a reason to run multicast, let's say if you were doing it point to point between two routers and you had some multicast packets, then yes, you have to enable it to, for it to work. But if you are not going to be using multicast, there's no point of running PIM because obviously you're creating overheads, you have PIM neighborship and then you're supporting multicast. What if somebody sends a multicast which you don't want them to use? So it depends if you want to use multicast or not. If you're not going to be using multicast, there's no point of, of enabling it. I see another question, which is, could you repeat star comma G and S comma G once again? The star comma G is coming from the client. So he's sending a join message, the star comma G, 
which is coming through IGMP. And then the gateway is sending the star comma G towards the server if it's dense mode by flooding or towards the RP if it's using sparse mode. S comma G is the actual multicast stream coming from server towards the client. Then I see another question, which is, can multicast span across the internet? If yes, how is there public private with multicast addresses? So yes, you can span across the internet. Obviously that's going to be done using L3 VPN. So obviously customers multicast traffic is going to be separated uh, from other customers, unless it's a global multicast, which is in the global table. So unless you're doing MVPN, where uh, customer multicast traffic is separate, global multicast is separate. So yes, you can span. If it's customers multi multicast traffic, you don't have issues of private or public or anything. Um, I see another question, which is the prune process is permanent or it repeats constantly. As long as there is a multicast stream coming in, the prune message would come in and it's a periodic message, it's not constant. So once the stop message happens, the prune and forward is all stopped. The star comma G is stopped. So there's, no, um, for the S comma G, the prune is constant. As long as the multicast stream is working, there's, there's a prune message from uh, the downstream router. It's the same, con it's a triggered message. So as soon as the client joins on that router, he stops sending prune and he immediately will send that I need multicast. So think of it like a VTP pruning. The same thing happens, right? If there's no active VLAN, that switch sends a prune message saying, hey, I don't need broadcast for, the, for VLAN 10. But as soon as a PC connects in VLAN 10 on that switch, he sends a message saying that, hey, I have a PC now, so I'm not pruning this anymore. And that's when the multicast goes towards that switch or that, that uh, the broadcast goes towards that switch. The same concept of VTP pruning. Then I have, uh, would R2 and R6 prune? I have another question here which says, would R2 and R6 prune? I thought they are, they also received the star comma G from R3. And so they also think they have a client. So uh, I don't really understand the question, but um, the star comma G, if it's dense mode, yes. Uh, there's no pruning for star comma G. Pruning is everywhere. There's no pruning at all for star comma G. It's just uh, flooding. There would never be a prune for star comma G. Pruning only happens for S comma G because S comma G is actual multicast. You don't care about bandwidth being used for star comma G because it's hardly 1K. There's nothing, there's no actual multicast stream, just a message. I see another question that R2 got star comma G from R3, yes. So it has a client downstream. Why does it send a prune message to R5? The reason it sends a prune message to R5 because R5 is not using the IGP path through R2, it's using the path through R6. That's why um, it's sending a prune message. I have another question which says that isn't sparse mode somehow using source specific multicast since it will have a direct path to server? The thing is that it's not really source specific multicast because the S comma G, yes, it's a direct path, but the direct path can only begin once it knows about the star comma G. So star comma G has to be present for S comma G to start. So it's not really source specific multicast because in source specific multicast, there is no star comma G. There's, if you do a show IPM route, you will never see any star comma G entries. You'll only find an S comma G entry. So, so it's like 
Why would you want to do so specific multicast? To reduce your routing table. Because imagine if I have hundreds and hundreds of multicast group addresses. So let's say if I have 100 multicast group addresses, then I would have 200 entries in my routing table of multicast. One for star comma G, one for S comma G. But if I use so specific multicast, I'll only have 100 S comma G entries. I won't have 100 star comma G entries. Okay. I have another question. So I'm gonna take one more question here. It says that how does OSPF use multicast to communicate? Does it require PIM to be enabled? I think OSPF uses 224.005. Does it use a different multicast method without PIM? So yes, uh, OSPF uses multicast 224.005 and six, and you don't require PIM for that. OSPF works obviously without PIM because the thing is that all routers are programmed to understand those addresses as a built-in. Like for example, even the host multicast address. So all routers, all, all host 224.001, they all are members of that. I mean, it's not a membership, there's no IGMP, there's no join group, there's no PIM, nothing. They all are programmed to understand that address by default. So you don't really have to enable PIM at all. That's built in, in the protocol itself. You don't even have to enable multicast routing to run OSPF. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed the webinar. I do have an upcoming webinar like how um, Brittany was, uh, mentioned earlier. I hope to see you in that webinar also. And if you do have a question, please feel free to email me. And um, if you need some help, you can always email me and we can always set up a time to discuss things that you would like some clarity on. All right. Thank you for attending the webinar.